Okay, thanks. I'm Michael Wolf. I spend all day writing compilers. That's what I really do when I'm not talking to smarter people than me. Now, I came here with some handouts. Everyone who was not local had tried to put one of these in your little bag. We brought some of these things. These are, we put these out every year for supercomputing. Um, so this is the 2.0. I put some more of these at the end of the aisles there. If, if you don't have one in your bag, come and take one. If you don't have one at the end of your aisle, come and steal one from somebody else. And um, I don't, I'm not going to take these back, nor any of these. I'm not taking these back. If you come to supercomputing, we'll have the 2.5 version of the OpenACC reference uh, handout. So come by the booth to get those. Now, um, you're here to talk about Fortran. This is a real language, right? <laughs> the original programming language. You know, I, I can argue that Fortran is the predecessor language to all high-level programming languages. And the reason I can argue that is, if you have an assignment statement, which direction does the assignment go? It goes from right to left. Why is that? Because Fortran says, let x equal this. They put x equal the right-hand side. And every other language has copied that. So Fortran is the original high-level programming language and the predecessor to all others. I had a guy come to me a week ago. He was complaining. He says, He's trying to help port some code. He says, why would anybody write a new application in Fortran? So well, why wouldn't they? I, I, the C++ guys, they're absolute bigots. No, no, not bigots. They're absolutely I mean, just, this is the only way to do things. Well, OK, fine. It's not. But um, I'm not a Fortran bigot either, but you know, it has its strengths, and we should take advantage of its strengths. So here we're, I'm going to talk uh, almost entirely exclusively about OpenACC and Fortran. I've got another lecture tomorrow afternoon talking about more advanced stuff in the future. <clears throat> so if you're asking questions about the future, you might want to just wait for tomorrow, and, and it'll all be answered. So the goal that we're trying to get to is single source, many targets. And so this means uh, multi-core or GPUs or host plus GPU or what have you. And it manages a couple of things. One of them is the data movement, movement from the host memory space to the GPU memory space. Um, somebody asked, is, are we always going to have these separate memories? And the answer is yes. And the reason is the GPU is a throughput-oriented device, so it needs a high bandwidth throughput-oriented memory system. The CPU is a latency-oriented device. It wants a low latency uh, organized memory. And the bandwidth optimized memory is more expensive, which means you can afford less of it. And so they're always going to be separate. And in, in fact, if anything, we'll talk about this tomorrow, it's going to get worse. Um, so anyway, uh, as Jeremy pointed out, data has to move between one and the other. When it goes to the GPU, it's a copy, not a move. So now you've got two copies of the data. Somebody has to manage the coherence between the two. OK? Just think of it. This is your problem. Now, we hope that this will be less of a problem in the future, that we can automate as much of this as possible. But today, you have to manage that. And we'll see examples of how and why you need to do that. And then parallelism management. That's the more fun part. So we get into the compute constructs um, and other things like that. Gang workers and vectors, we'll talk about that a little bit. And then there's more levels of concurrency, like offloading things asynchronously to the device. And the host goes on to do other things. That's a little bit more advanced. I wouldn't suggest you start that right away, but we'll be getting into that. And then interoperability. How does OpenACC interoperate with CUDA? And how does it interoperate with OpenMP? And I should say, how does it interoperate with MPI? There's really not much issue there. So this is, if you've never seen an open ACC program, this is what it's going to look like. In Fortran, because that's the real language here, you've got uh, the Sentinel in the front. So it is intentionally and purposely designed to look like OpenMP. Because when we first designed this, the intent was we would just replace ACC with OMP. Um, that didn't happen yet, anyway. Um, but OK, so it looks, the directives are syntactically very similar to OpenMP. A different Sentinel, 
You've got parallel and parallel. That looks a heck of a lot like OpenMP. You've got loop. That looks a lot like OMP do, except I can have nested loops. We'll talk about why you want that. And then you've got this data stuff. So you want, need to manage the data movement. Okay, need to. You will want to manage the data movement between host and device. And, and then managing the parallelism. And uh, some of these things, you'll, if you're familiar with OpenMP, they, they're going to be very familiar here as well. Uh, a, uh, a, a short digression here. So um, what is this gang and vector? So OpenACC exposes three levels of parallelism. OpenMP, classical OpenMP exposes one, parallel threads. It's either running sequentially or it's running across multiple threads redundantly or it's doing work sharing of, of loop iterations across the, the parallel threads. So those are your three modes of operation, but all you have is either one thread or many threads, one level of parallelism. OpenMP4, now I doubt anybody here has used OpenMP4 because there aren't very many compilers that even pretend to claim to use it or implement it. Um, but when you get there, you will see OpenMP4 now has three levels of parallelism. You've got threads, and within a thread you can have SIMD, you're exposing SIMD parallelism, and you can have multiple teams of threads, each of which has SIMD parallelism. And uh, the teams, the reason for the teams construct is um, on a device like a GPU, you want to use all the parallelism, as Jeremy pointed out, you've got all these uh, streaming multiprocessors, these SMs, and the SMs have these CUDA cores. So you want to take all the multiprocessors, all the cores and all the multiprocessors and get them all working. And the problem is with the parallel loop, there's a barrier at the end of a parallel loop. And there's no way to implement a barrier safely across all the threads of all the SMs on a GPU. It just You can't do that in today's hardware. There's, it just doesn't exist. And so that you would have to end the kernel, go back to the host. Right? So now you have to split the kernel. And, and then there's a lot of state you need to carry forward. So now, in the research world, people have done this and made it work. But that's not a product. And no one would use it because it wouldn't perform poorly. So now they said, OK, we'll have multiple teams. A team goes to one SM. And then within a team, you can do barriers because, OK, that's where that came from. Well, OpenACC was ahead of that game, and so we have three levels of parallelism. Gang is, would be like the, the teams. That's outer level parallelism. No synchronization across the gangs. And no barrier at the end of a gang loop. Vector is the innermost level. And for those of us coming from the classical supercomputing world, we understand vector. What is this SIMD crap? Isn't that just the way you implement vector? Yes, it is, right? You implement vector instructions with SIMD operations, fine. So this is a, running this in SIMD mode within a gang in this case. And what are the features I want to optimize for when I'm doing my vector operations? Anybody here? What are you optimizing for? You're doing a vector operation. What's one of the things you want to do in your vector loop? Go fast. Come on, come on, come on. Was that? Memory. What about memory? Which, takes, which means you have to do what? Preload. So stride one. Uh, you say, oh, obviously. <laughs> that was too obvious. Well, well it's because you're, you've been doing this almost as long as I have. So you understand this stuff. These young guys, what is this stride thing? I was read a hackathon. I was trying to explain strides. So I never heard the word stride. What does that mean? Well, because today's cache coherent, most, most single, what, are they, what is stride? Well, I don't need to think about strides. Well, you do, really, but it's really important. So the vector loop, you want to be the stride one loop. There's a third level, which we're not using here, called worker, which is why you have gangs, gangs of workers. We were going to use different words, but certain members of the committee had problems using different words. So I don't like the words, but they are what they are. But I'm, I would encourage you when you're starting to look at only gang level and worker level parallelism. This will, sorry, gang level and vector level. Gang and vector, 
Gang would be parallel across the different threads. Worker is vector operations, the stride one operations within a thread. And then as you get more experience, then start adding worker level if you think you need it. You can do almost everything with gang and vector. Would COVID run without the gang and the vector? Would... Oh, it would. Sure, it would run sequential. Oh, in fact, oh, that's a good question here. What would happen if you took both of these out? What would happen if that said OMP parallel and I didn't have OMP do? What would it do? It would do it ten times the same thing. It would do it redundantly on every thread, which would be horrible. And the same thing would happen here. So you need loop for the parallel. Or it would just do it redundantly on every gang. Now, what's not shown here is how many gangs does it launch? And you can specify that. And you can say, well, obviously, it should launch n gangs. But you can, you can give it a number of gangs, num gangs, and say, I want to run it across 13 gangs or 32 gangs or what have you. And the compiler makes sure all the iterations get done. And there's reasons to optimize number of gangs, perhaps, but not many good ones. What our compiler will do is it'll take the trip count of the gang loop and use that for the number of gangs. Well, it's dynamically, it's dynamically scheduled, right? So, yeah, so they'll, you only have you know, 16 or 13 number SMs, so yeah, it spreads them across, yes. yes. Um, or, and sometimes an SM, depending on how many threads within a gang, how many vector lanes within a gang, and one SM might have two or three or, or mul multiple gangs time-sharing inside itself. You know, there's, that's a fruitful area of research, and there's a publication waiting to be written there. Um, my experimentation has shown that's a very hard problem to solve in general, um, and I'd love to figure this out, because the compiler should, should just figure this out somehow, right? There's, it's, it's not science, it's just a little bit of study and a little bit of math, I think. Okay, so um, one thing here. So this is, these are called constructs. This is a parallel construct or a compute construct. This is a loop construct. The same terminology from OpenMP. It's a data construct. Uh, then you have regions. So a region is a dynamic range of the construct. So this is a, a, data, a, a parallel construct. Here's the data construct, but the data region, the dynamic range, includes the call to MatVec. So here it's copying data over to the device. That data is seen inside here. So in effect, things like this are what you're going to end up wanting to do, is to copy the data as far out as possible. It would be the same whether you're doing this explicitly in CUDA, C, CUDA, Fortran, any other language. You want to move the data infrequently, particularly with today's PCI Express bus. The PCI bus is a great I.O. bus. It really sucks as a memory bus. So. You want to uh, minimize the frequency and volume of data that's being moved and, and in, increase the regularity of the data that's being moved, which means a lot of contiguous data. So you want these data regions, these data constructs moved out of your call tree as, as far as is reasonably makes sense. And the only reason not to move them all the way out is, well, um, it doesn't have a heck of a lot of memory. You know, the systems you have here have got 12 gigabytes of memory on each GPU. 12 gigabytes, you know, when I was growing up, that was the entire data storage of the University of Illinois. Um, now it's, you fit that on a, on a USB key, so it's not very big. Uh, all right, so there's, there's that. And the uh, data clause here. So this uh, clause tells the compiler that for this parallel region, these arrays are already present on the device. So that'll be a term I use a lot, present and not present. Present means there's some outer data region out there that has already moved the data over to the device and it's already going to be over there. So use the data that's there. And so it will find the addresses and use that data inside the body of this loop. And um, we've found many people have larger and larger compute regions with a lot of data. Question? Yeah, you're right, it's a typo. It should be M. Uh, 
All right. Somewhere here, there's a mouse. You'll have to fix this in your in your uh, copy once you get it. There. All right. So these, right? That's a that's something else. This is the local name of the array. And uh, I don't know why that's in red. I've forgotten why that should be in red. It wasn't in red last time I looked at it. Um, I probably changed it when I was editing, right? So, okay, so we have a, another, this is new now in OpenACC 2.5, but our compiler accepts it, a default present clause, which says any data that I don't have any other data clause here, I'm promising will be present on the device. All right, so uh, later tomorrow, I think, we'll be talking about errors that can be made. And you can use present, which means the compiler generates code to check that the data is present. What if it's not present, then you're going to get a runtime error. Now, um, uh, okay, that's, that's fine, as good as it goes. And then you've got the two copies of the data. Now, how do you manage coherence between the two copies? Well, one way would be, at the end of the data region, the data would come back, and then they'd be made coherent, because there's only one copy. What if you don't want to bring the data back, like you're doing a big MPI code, and you want to do a halo exchange, or some kind of exchange of data between host and device? So um, you can use update directives, and this generates code. In this case, update the host copy of X from the device copy, and then it does something else, and then it updates the device copy from the host. So you might use something like that if you're doing a halo exchange, or here you're writing out some data, some temporary intermediate values to a, to a file. Someone's going to ask, what about GPU direct? Can you do GPU direct so you're doing halo exchanges directly from the GPU addresses? And the answer is yes, you can, and we'll talk about that tomorrow as well. Can you make these asynchronous? Is that the question? Yes, you can. And we'll talk about that later on um, this morning. Um, is that another question? Nope. All right, so uh, some other things that you can do. And these, this is uh, uh, sometimes what we've showed so far was uh, structured data constructs. I'm talking about the data management first here, not the... Uh, Compute management and um, oops, got the wrong set here. So the uh, uh, for data management, sometimes these, these structured constructs are fine as far as they go, but sometimes you want to manage things in a more dynamic way. Like you're calling an init routine, and the init routine is going to initialize the data, and at that point you want to put the data on the device. So maybe the init routine is five levels deep in some call tree. So where do I put my data construct? Well, we have a dynamic data directive. So this is basically like the top of a data construct. This says, here, put the data on the device dynamically, right here. So it copies the data over to the device. And it will live there until later on, there's the end of a dynamic data lifetime, which would be exit data. And you can do an exit data copy out, which brings it back, or an exit data delete, which just deletes it. Um, you can do an enter data copy in, which allocates it and initializes it from the host, or you can do an enter data create, which just allocates the data and doesn't initialize it. So you get uninitialized data. Um, we found these uh, really useful in C++ class libraries where you create a new class and it wants to manage the data lifetimes dynamically and the compiler's got no hope, and the user has no hope, and in fact, the user doesn't even think about the device because it's all hidden in some C++ class library. But we found cases for it in Fortran as well. Just not as many. And here's an example with the, uh, uh, the exit data, just deleting the data. Now, you want to, the enter data would have to f f uh, follow wherever the data gets allocated, be it global data, or uh, dynamic, I'm sorry, allocatable data, and the exit data has to precede where it gets deallocated. 
Um, and the reason for that is it uses the address as the key, the host address as the key. Question. It's, as I just said, it's not done by name, it's done by the address. So, so it uses, there's a, in the runtime system, there's a table to map host address to device address. And so it uses the address of the host data to key into the table to find the device address. Um, and we, we just saw the ch things change names across subroutine boundaries. I, I did, unless you're a bad typist like I am. And one more feature we have, and, and this is already implemented in the PGI compiler and will be coming in other compilers soon. If you have an allocatable array, and you have the directive, declare create for the allocatable array, then when you allocate the array, it will allocate both host and device copies. So at this point, I've got the data on the host and device. This loop here is being run on the host. But I could have put an ACC parallel loop here and run this on the device. But if I run it on the host, then I can update the device copy from the host. You do an update device from host to device, or other way around, depending on where I ran that loop. So the directive says, when you allocate it, allocate both copies. When you deallocate, deallocate both copies. In this case, it's a global data. So over here, I'm using the data. I don't need any directives or clauses about that variable v because it's a global variable, it's a module variable. So obviously here I know about the data and it'll just make sure that it's using the right data. Question? Is, it, is the compiler smart enough to realize, for example, on the right hand column, that if you have a create v and then your subroutine uh, is visibly uh, executing on the host and you then have an update uh, host? That now, okay, remember I said coherence management is somebody's problem. And no, the compiler, that's, a, that's, a, so that's an interesting, the long-term question there is, uh, that's a common error is I'm, I'm, uh, I've got a coherence problem between host and device copies. I'm, I'm referencing stale data, either on the device or on the, on the host, and how can I find this error? And the, the real answer is there's no good answer to that today. Um, we have a preliminary design for a way to solve that problem, but it would involve uh, somebody hacking Valgrind to, uh, to determine that for us, and we haven't done that yet. In, in the equivalent in C or C++, does that mean you are um, overloading? Uh, there is no equivalent in C or C++. Uh, we don't deal with low-level languages for nice features like this. This is a Fortran-only feature. Fortran Absolutely. Fortran has arrays. What does C have? It's got a pointer. C++ will have multi-arrays. Sorry? C++ will have multi-arrays. C++ has no arrays. C++ has a class library to simulate an array. I'm sorry. I have to, I'm telling it like it is here. I'm an engineer. You will get some marketing talk from me, but I'm going to tell you how I really think it is. This is, okay, fine. But Fortran is a higher level language. Um, okay, so the data construct. So the construct goes from data to end data. And the life, the region goes, is the, the dynamic range of the construct that can go uh, across procedure boundaries. Has no go to's out to out of or into the region. It's just like um, no go to's into or out of an OMP parallel region. No returns. Okay, so it really has to. You go into the top, you come out at the bottom. Um, blah blah blah. I already said that. The dynamic data lifetime is from the enter data to the matching exit data. And uh, okay, fine. And the data is either present or not present. So now there are two questions you're going to ask. Can you have nested data regions? Yes. Can you have nested data regions with the same arrays? Because you, know, you may have one routine, you've got a data region in it, and then sometimes it's being called from main, and sometimes it's being called from something else. And you want to move the data outside that routine. Is that OK? And the answer is yes. And the reason is 
um, let's say up here, ACC data copy X. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with OpenACC, we used to have copy and P copy, or present or copy. And the P copy would say, test to see if it's already present. And if it is, use the copy that's there. And if it's not, then make the copy and bring it down here. But if it was already present, just leave it there. And don't do any data movement because presumably the, the, the current data is already on the device. Okay, that's the coherence problem. Um, and now the OpenACC 2.5, which will be coming out, has gotten rid of P copy and present or copy, so it's just copy. Everything is, is what used to be P copy. If you're using a compilers other than PGI, in particular Cray, then in front of all these data clauses, you should put a P. P copy, P create, P copy out, P copy in, right? I knew there were four. And then that would be, that'll be portable. But um, all you're going to see here is the non P versions. All right. And somebody's going to say, what if it was a nested data region, but I really had the device on the host. I always want to do the data movement from host to device. Well, then you should be using create and put an update directive. Because the update directive will always get executed. The copy data may not do the data movement if the data was already present. That's all data management. All right, a little bit about parallelism management. So this is getting the thing to run in parallel on the device. So we have, um, it's all about loops. So you'll see OpenACC is less rich than OpenMP. We don't have parallel sections in OpenACC. There are almost no synchronization primitives in OpenACC. So it's designed for algorithms that are really highly scalably parallel. It doesn't even have a critical section. You say, oh my god, I gotta have a critical section. Well, you've got three possible solutions. Write it in some other language. Um, rewrite the algorithm so it really is scalable. Um, or use OpenMP. Um, I've got no problem. If it's gonna solve your problem, that's great. Okay, so here's the uh, data part. Here's the parallel loop part. So. This is the ACC parallel and parallel. So just like OpenMP, this creates a number of gangs. They start running redundantly until they see a loop, a loop oh, sorry, a work sharing construct, which is ACC loop. And unlike OpenMP, we use ACC loop for both C and Fortran. It's not ACC do, ACC for, although the PGI compiler will accept that for historical reasons. Um, it's ACC loop, and it tells here, run this outer loop across gangs, run this inner loop across uh, vector lanes. So you see, that's just a matrix vector multiply. Um, uh, let's see here. Yes. No, you, can, you could have make that copy out, and then it would allocate uninitialized data and then copy the result out. Uh, and how important is that to optimize your data movement? So there's, there's a couple of things. When you're managing the data, you want to manage how much data gets put on the device, when it gets put on the device, when data movement happens, and then the direction of the data movement. You have to copy, I mean, the safest thing is copy all the data both directions. But as you say, and as Jeremy said, and as I said, the data movement takes time. The PCI bus is not fast. If I'm copying a lot of data, that's, there's startup cost, and then there's the cost per byte. I want to minimize that as well. So, so yes, it can make a big difference. It can make a significant difference. If your program is uh, bound by how much data gets moved, it can make an immense difference. It'll be the difference between, you know, uh, uh, performance or not performance. Um, if the data 
directives get moved out far enough, then the data movement is almost a nil event. Maybe it doesn't make so much of a difference. But we've seen examples both ways. And it depends on uh, you know, how, much, how big your data set is. Was it going to fit on the device? That makes a big difference, for instance. Um, okay, uh, minor, uh, this is a technical detail. So when I say ACC parallel, as I said, it's anything between the parallel and the loop is going to be executed redundantly by all the gangs. Here I've got another level of parallelism, vector parallelism. So is everything between the loop gang and the loop vector executed redundantly by each vector lane, for instance? If I said ACC loop worker, is everything between the loop gang and loop worker executed redundantly by every worker? And that answer is no. Um, that's the loop gang will fire up one vector lane of one worker of that gang, and then when it gets to the loop worker or loop vector, then it uh, enables all the other workers or vector lanes for the, for the um, lifetime of the loop, and then it goes back down to one vector lane and or one worker. So the only redundancy comes, across, comes from across gangs. Just like OpenMP is redundant across threads, this is redundant across gangs. Oops. Am I doing the right, am I going in the right direction here? I think I am. All right. Here are your data clauses. Copy is both copy in plus out. Copy in and out, either copies in or copies out, but not both, meaning you're either allocating uninitialized data or you're not bringing back any updated results. So this is similar to Fortran intent in, intent out, but not quite the same. Create, if you're a creationist, you just allocate the data and then use updates to manage all the data movement. Delete is like the end of the data construct, but only used on the exit data. Another question you might ask is, can you, can you mix data on the enter, exit data, and on the data? And yes, you can. And so what happens is, uh, in any of those cases, if, it, if you get to the enter data or the top of a data construct, if the data is already present, it doesn't do anything. It just uses the data that's already there. When you get to the bottom, it says, am I the last one? It basically has a reference counting mechanism. If I'm the last one, then I'll deallocate it and do the appropriate copies. Um, can you run into interesting problems where well, yeah, there are interesting problems you can run into, but usually that's not a problem. And I already mentioned that. All right. Uh, can I ask you about this piece of copy and copy copying, and they are not present anymore. And they do not exist anymore. Right. In 2.5. So if you use, in the past when you used ACC copy, so it's unconditionally copied. If you passed, if you said ACC copy, and the data was already present, it's a runtime error. So the reason we felt safe changing the definition was no correct program would become illegal. Yeah. Incorrect programs might work. Right. That's a good question, though. Uh, I think I just saw this. All right. So um, this is the same thing with the uh, data directives, the full data directives inside the matrix vector multiply. And so uh, what's going to happen here is it will find the data is already present because I copied in already x and copied in v, which are, which are what? r and v, m was not copied in here, so this will do the data allocation to copy for M, the worst part, because that's the whole matrix, and then do the loop, and then it'll, uh, let's see here, we'll deallocate M here, and then uh, update the result array and deallocate the data down here. Something like that. And I mentioned the declare directive. The declare, you can have uh, the most common case, of, say, the, the case that we use it for is uh, 
allocatable arrays inside modules. You've got some data. You, just wanna, you really just want to allocate it on the device. So you do a declare create, and then when you allocate it, it's allocated on the host and device. And someone here is going to say, well, doesn't that waste host memory from allocating it on the host and the device? And the truth is it wastes host address bits. But the memory on the host doesn't, it gets allocated, but it doesn't even get in the page table <coughs> until you refer to it, and it takes a page fault. So you're allocating the address bits, you never use them, nothing gets wasted. You've got a lot of bits. Uh, inside a subroutine, you can also do a declare create or a declare copy in for various data, and then it, it works more or less like a data construct around the routine, except you can have return statements. You can't have a return statement inside a data construct. Inside a routine, you can, and so you can put a declare create for data you want live for the lifetime of the subroutine. Automatic arrays in the subroutine? Automatic arrays as well, <coughs> yes. Declare, declare create? Declare create. You have to have it to clause. A declare is, is the name of the directive that you have to create or copy. And if it's automatic, it's not been initialized, so you do declare, declare create. Yeah. Um, and here's an example with some declare directives instead of the instead of the data clauses on the procedure, it's declare directives that say pretty much the same thing. Except here it's saying that R must already must be present or I'm expecting a runtime error. Now you may want a compiler to detect R should be present and, and wind up the call tree and find out, make sure it's inside a data region for that for whatever gets passed into R. And one could imagine a compiler doing that, but our compiler sadly does not. Uh, we talked a little bit about, um, this is uh, coherence management, the update directive. And so update device or update host. There's also update self, which just means host. And the reason we have, up, we call it update self is we're moving towards uh, the world where the, the um, OpenACC code may be running on the device. If I'm running on the device and I say update host, does that mean push it to the host? And over here, update host means pull it to the host. And so it would mean different things, because here on the host it says, bring it to me. And over here, update host would mean push it to him. So, they would mean different things. So we went to update self, so it's self-relative. Update self always means bring the updated data to me, wherever I am. So uh, and it's the best word we can think of because we don't know any other languages. So update self just means update my copy from the device. And if it's running on the device, well, then my copy is the device copy. I don't need to do any updates at all. Uh, and you can do subarrays. Even non-contiguous subarrays, non-contiguous subarray, updating a non-contiguous subarray will be more expensive because the data movement is actually done with a DMA engine. The DMA engine, you give a start point and a length. So that's the way it works. And, and so it's, you want to update a non-contiguous region, it's, it's multiple DMA transfers, or it's a single DMA transfer to some temporary space and then a copy by the host to for the non-contiguous part. Either way, it's more expensive. When you're doing data movement, if you can get away with moving large contiguous regions, that's better than moving non-contiguous regions, even if it's less data. And uh, I think this is the same, uh, the same slide that we just saw. And I'm supposed to highlight something, and I don't remember what it was. Okay, so now we're into the, the more fun part, although you probably spend less time on this than you do on data management. You'll spend a lot of time optimizing data traffic between host and device. As Jeremy pointed out, in the future, the penalty today, the penalty for making a bad decision is either your program gets wrong answers, which is pretty bad, or you're, you're spending a lot more time moving data between host and device, which is a performance detriment, but not a correctness problem. In the future, that latter one will get, will be less important. 
um, for things like, like Summit and Sierra and these power plus GPU, because I have this NV link, which will be uh, order of magnitude more speed between, host, between the host and device. Almost at memory speeds between host and device. So uh, the data movement will, I won't say uh, the, the cost will go away, but it's going to be um, much less important to get it right. You still have a correctness problem. And we'll get into the managed memory thing in a little bit. OK, so we talked about the parallel construct. Jeremy mentioned the kernels construct. That'll be coming up shortly. So the parallel construct works pretty much like open and p-parallel. Start some parallelism, work share across those gangs, and then do more parallelism within that across vector lanes, so vector operations within there. Um, they have a parallel region. You can call procedures on the device. Now, the main difference uh, with calling procedures on a device versus calling procedures inside an OpenMP parallel region is here the compiler, in order to call the procedure on the device, has to compile the procedure for the device. With OpenMP, it's already compiling the procedure for the host because it's compiling for the host to begin with. So, so that's not an issue. So here we need to know, we being the compiler, the compiler needs to know which procedures you're going to call on the device so it can make sure to compile them for the device. Now, one could imagine a compiler to detect this automatically and then uh, compile those routines. And in fact, our C++ compiler will do that, uh, within a file anyway. It'll just compile everything that's ever called for the, for the uh, device. Um, and we're looking at trying to do the same thing for Fortran as well, but we haven't gotten there yet. For C++, it's particularly important because of templated class library expansions. So it's a mess. When, when do they execute the uh, That's a really good question. So um, it's, it's more detailed than I was going to go into today, but I'd be glad to answer that question. So what happens is um, uh, there are two modes of operation, whether you're using the CUDA runtime API or the driver API. The runtime API is the one you use normally with NVCC and, and CUDA. And what happens there is uh, you compile the program and you link it and it creates the CUDA binary and that gets embedded into a data section of your executable. And if you're using the runtime API, and you'll, we'll get to why I'm even talking about runtime API, you get to the runtime API. When the program starts up, dot init time, before it gets to main, it attaches to the device and creates a context on the device. But that's, that's a lightweight thing. And then when it does the first operation on the device, a data allocation or the first kernel launch, usually it's a data allocation, then it will actually instantiate the context on the device and push all the uh, code to the device. So it's when you do your first operation. Uh, and that involves, as I mentioned this morning, if, if you're on Linux, powering the thing up. That's when you pay your, your multi-second penalty. Uh, the OpenACC, by default, uses the driver API, which is a lower level API. So there's no dot init time overhead. But it's the same thing. When you do the first allocation or a kernel launch on the device, then it has to create a context in order to do the allocation. And that's when the, the uh, code gets pushed over to the device. The answer? OK. Um, all right. And we talked about parallel regions, blah, blah, blah. We've got three levels of parallelism. We're going to focus on gang and vector. So the difference on a GPU with vector parallelism, so if you're a CUDA programmer, and this morning you were, if you're a CUDA pro well, actually you weren't. You are were using a CUDA library. Hmm, okay. Well, if you were a CUDA programmer, you learned about thread IDX and block IDX. So the gang corresponds to the block index. And in fact, gangs get mapped. The gang ID is mapped from block idx.x. Vector parallelism, that's the threads within a block. In fact, the vector lane is thread idx.x. For PGI, you'll see worker parallelism will be thread idx.y, but let's ignore that. Thread idx.x. Well, how many vector lanes do you have? Well, if you're running on an Intel Haswell, if you're compiling for Intel Haswell and you're, you're using vector operations on an Intel Haswell, how many lanes do you have? Well, it's eight in single precision. Is that right? And four in double precision? or is, is it? Yeah, it's four in double precision, eight in single precision. So it's not really even a constant, but it's only two constants. 
Um, GPU, it can be pretty much anything. Now, Jeremy said you want multiples of 32. The reason you need multiples of 32 is because the hardware executes in groups of 32. So you can say I want 16 threads in my thread block, but you're going to get 32 anyway. Just 16 of them will be doing nothing. So you may as well have a multiple of 32 because that's what you're going to get. So, but it can be any multiple of 32. 192, 544, whatever you need. A uh, compiler will try to figure this out, and it has some defaults. Um, typical numbers we see are 128 and 256. And the reason those are typical numbers is, um, Jeremy mentioned occupancy. You want to put as much parallelism running in parallel on the device as possible, so you want the thread blocks to be big enough so that um, they're using as much of the device as possible, but not so big so that you only get one thread block on there. On the other hand, if you had a SPMV, sparse matrix vector multiply, maybe it's really sparse and it doesn't have 128 non-zeros. You're using that for the vector loop. You don't want 128. Maybe you only want that to be 32. So that's where you might want to micro-optimize those numbers. When it actually launches the kernel, what's doing the CUDA launch? And so the number of gangs and workers and the vector length, well, the number of gangs anyway can be an expression. In the PGI compiler today, th the, these two have to be uh, uh, literal constants, not literal constants, it'd be constants. Yeah, essentially, literal constants are, are parameters. It'd be compile time constants. And I'll wait for you to ask the question why, but the, uh, um, these values, number of gangs and vector length, are going to be fixed when you launch the kernel. You can't say this loop, I'm going to use a vector length of 32, and later on I'll use a vector length of 192, because it's already launching a thread block of 192 or 32. You're going to get what you get. And usually... It's a parallel region with a loop inside. So usually we just combine the two, ACC parallel loop. Uh, with OpenMP, you might typically have open M OMP parallel outside some sequential loop, and then inside there, OMP do, and another OMP do, and another OMP do, and then a while loop, and OMP do, OMP do, OMP do, and a while loop. And you can do that here as well. The difference is with OMP, there's a barrier at the end of that, per, the end of that do. I had three do's. I'm having three barriers, and then go around the while loop, and then you get three barriers. No barrier at the end of a, at the gang parallel loop. So you can do that, but it damn well better be really independent. You may ask, why, why, what makes it so hard to do a barrier? Well, two things make it hard to do a barrier make it basically impossible to successfully do a barrier. The first one you could say you could work around. The first one is the memory model. Okay, now you're into real architecture and programming languages, right? C++ has a real memory model. Fortran kind of tries to have a memory model, but not so much. C++ did a much better job. And the question is, he's a thread and he's a thread. He does a store and he does a read. And then he, he, he's waiting on this this value to reach the reach one, because that's the lock. And then he's going to set a value, and then he's going to read the value that got set. Right? So he stores value x, and then he sets the, sets the, the lock, says I'm ready. And then he read, he's spinning on the lock to see if it's ready, and then he reads the value x. Okay, did that make any sense? Stores a value, sets the <coughs> semaphore, spins on the semaphore, and then reads the value. And, right, that's defined. Right? That should just work. The store value, and then I store a later value, and then here I'm reading the earlier value, and I'm reading the, the value that's read later on. Well, that depends on a memory model that says those, the reads don't go out of order. And the GPUs don't necessarily preserve that. And why don't they? Because of the G part. Graphics doesn't need that. It's highly parallel. So it's optimized for highly parallel operations. Let me digress for a minute. Why are we buying GPUs to do computing? Why are we buying GPUs to do computing? Isn't cheap? Sorry? Isn't that cheap? Because they're cheap. Because they're essentially free. You look at any high-performance accelerator designed exclusively for high-performance computing. Can you name one that's alive today? 
Oh, ClearSpeed tried. IBM was selling Cell. Remember Cell? That was a graphics processor. There are some SX, which is well, quite amazing how uh, NET can, can afford to do that. But there's not very doggone many. Um, uh, talking to people who really know what they're talking about, the cost to design a chip to go from, ah, this, is, this is kind of the block diagram I want to actually do the RTL and the layout and get it out and, and test it. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. That's before you get a working chip. And I'm sorry, HPC cannot afford that. But uh, Lara Croft can. So we get it for free. So that's the way it's going to be. Well, the same reason we're buying x86 processors today, right? Because PowerPoint pays for it, and we get it for free. So OK, um, so that's one point. The other point is. I'm launching a thousand gangs. Well, I've only got 13 SMs, and maybe I can fit eight of them at a time if I have small gangs. I mean, the number of vector length isn't very long. So that gives me, what, 94, no, 104 gangs running. What happened to the other 896? They're waiting. I want to do a barrier across the gangs. Well, 104 are waiting on a barrier. The other 896 are waiting to get launched. You're stuck. There's no barrier across gangs. Um, will there ever be? Uh, maybe, maybe not. But um, you should be thinking about barrier-free algorithms. Now, if I'm an OpenMP, why did I put my OMP, do, my OMP parallel so far out and then do the, the do's inside? Because with many implementations, the launch, the parallelism launch is expensive. I'm trying to amortize the launch of the parallelism. Uh, with OpenACC and, in fact, uh, with the PGI compiler and OpenMP, launching the parallel construct is not very expensive, so that's less of an issue. It's less of an issue today than it used to be. So there's your uh, parallel construct around a loop. Now, there's an error here. It should be obvious what's the error. No loop. There's no loop, right? I'm doing this redundantly. It'll run this perfectly happily, redundantly across each one of my gangs. My performance will be bad. So I need at least this. I need at least ACC loop, and I really want loop. There's only one loop, so I want it to run across gangs and vector lanes. And what if I just put gang on here and not vector? Well, it depends on the compiler you're using. The PGI compiler will implicitly, if there's nothing else inside this loop, we'll map this to gangs and vectors. But strictly speaking, a strict implementation of the compiler of the language would say, OK, you get this one per gang, so you get one thread in every thread block running this. And so you, it, again, the performance will um, not be very good across all compilers. Uh, with nested loops, and this is, nested loop, this is where Fortran really starts to shine. It's got real multi-dimensional dynamically allocated arrays. And I don't, other languages, other languages being C++, other languages don't have that. And so because of that, you end up with, you, you iterate over them and with nested loops. So now I get my nested parallelism. And so this is where you're going to start seeing real performance because you know, you've got n squared operations going on here. And so now you want your inner stride one operation mapped to the vector dimension and your outer uh, operation mapped across gangs, typically. And um, so here's your loop directive. What uh, clauses do you have? You, all these can go, obviously, in the same clause. So sequential would tell it, uh, run the sequentially in spite of what you think, because I'm smarter than you are. And you are. You're smarter than the compiler. Or gang or vector or worker, for instance. Um, but here we're talking gang or vector. Auto tells the compiler, you know, um, I don't want to think about it. Figure out what type of parallelism to use. And in fact, auto-detect whether the loop is parallel. So there it will use dependence analysis, classical vectorizing, parallelizing compiler technology, which you know, is good as far as it goes, but it, it's not great for programs bigger than, than the size of your screen anyway. Independent, we'll see why you'd want independent uh, shortly here. Reduction would be. Um, just like in OpenMP, in fact, the reductions are the same as in OpenMP. 
private and collapse should be uh, familiar for those of you who are familiar with OpenMP. Okay, now there's this kernels construct. So the difference between, the classical difference between ACC parallel and ACC kernels. And when we were designing the language, we had a lot of discussions about whether we wanted to have two or one, and um, we ended up with both, and so they're both there. The, the, the key difference between parallel and kernels is parallel is like open and peace. It says, go parallel, and I'll tell you where to do work sharing. Kernels says, there's a bunch of loops in here, and the default would be loop auto. You, Mr. Compiler, you analyze the loops, you determine if they're parallel, and if they are, then you determine whether to run them across gangs or vector lanes or what have you. And it's a place to start. All right. And this is typically what we do, actually, in Fortran, is we start putting in any ACC kernels, look at the messages coming out of the compiler, decide, well, it didn't do a very good job, or I can fine-tune it, or I'm going to port to another compiler that I don't trust, or any number of other reasons, and then I'll change that to ACC parallel. Um, usually, it's compiler didn't do a very good job. Um, and then um, it will determine worker vector gang parallelism. It, if the kernel's region has more than one loop, it might combine them into a single kernel or multiple kernels. Um, although usually it's the same thing here. We usually ACC kernels loop one loop at a time. And if you say ACC kernels loop or parallel loop, you don't need end parallel or end kernel, but um, you can put that in if you like. And it's kernels plural, not, para not sequential. Okay, fine. Is there anything else? Um, not much there. And so the classical example here is ACC kernels, all the arrays are present. No error here. I don't have to tell it ACC loop. This is the loop because the compiler is going to analyze it and determine, in this case, quite likely that's a parallel loop unless one of those is an array pointer. And here's another big difference between Fortran and C, or C++, is not everything is a pointer that might alias with everything else, right? In C++, it's a disaster. It can tell almost never it can do almost no auto-parallelization. Auto um, with Fortran, it can do quite a bit more. So you said that <coughs> compiler does quite a lot of work on this ACC kernels to analyze it. So yes. Responsibility is more like on compiler than user. Yes. And how about ACC parallel? Does it analyze anything? It act <coughs> and that depends on the implementation. And PGI, it does. It will... Uh, only do gang parallelism where you have an ACC loop. But it may also do inner loops in vector parallelism using classical vectorizing technology, yes. The Cray does as well, I believe. Cray is obviously, in basically, they didn't quite invent vectorizing compiler technology, but close enough. And so they've been doing this for longer than I've been doing compilers, actually. So. And nested parallel loops, the same thing. I don't need to tell it to parallelize both loops, and I don't need to tell it to run the inner loop across the vector lanes because it's got at least that much intelligence. Maybe not much more, but okay, there it is. So uh, <clears throat> this we would say is more prescriptive. Kernels is more descriptive. So. ACC parallel, the burden is on the programmer. Kernels, the burden is more on the compiler. How far away is the compiler if it's not actually existing from being able to use something like a minus 4 to power GPU? Switch on the command line and stick in a kernel loop. It sounds similar to a certain extent. Okay, that's a very good that's question. That's really what you think you want. That actually, I'm sorry, that is what you want. Why do I need to do anything? I'll just, just turn on a compiler flag. So, and because, you know, I mean, auto vectorization has worked for 40 years, right? Pretty well. Okay, so. Hmm? It's never no, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. No, 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 no. And so here's, here's the long form of this question. So in 1978, I was a grad student at Illinois, 
and we had some extra travel money at the end of the end of the fiscal year. Now you understand, if you have extra money at the end of the fiscal year for a research contract and you don't spend it, the next year you get less money, because obviously you didn't need it. So you have to spend it. So they said, okay, uh, you finished a degree, let's send you with a trip. So they sent me to Los Alamos Labs. There was a little workshop at Los Alamos Labs. Los Alamos, you may recall, got the first Cray-1. You may also not realize they actually rejected it. I think it came here. It came to somewhere in Britain because they rejected it because it did not have um, uh, error correcting memory. It did not have SecDid. And so it came, I believe it came here, and they replaced all the bad chips. And so it was the fastest Cray in the world until they came up with the, the next model. Anyway, every, everyone since then did. They found that 90% of the machine check failures were unreproducible single bit parity errors, which SecDid memory would have corrected. Anyway, okay, so they, they, they had the Cray 1 there. And so almost every presentation there was by scientists saying, oh my God, this compiler is horrible. <clears throat> the vectorizing compiler doesn't do anything. I ought to rewrite my whole program. It's all this whining and complaining. Now, I was a young, impressionable grad student. Okay, relatively young. I was probably your age. Uh, young, impressionable grad student. And uh, now, the other thing you have to realize about the Cray 1 is the reason it sold so many is not because it was a vector computer, but because it was the fastest scalar computer on the planet. It had a blazingly fast 80 megahertz clock which was twice the speed of the CDC 7600, which was about twice the speed as the fastest this thing IBM could come out with. But then you had this vector instruction set, and if you run on the vector instruction set, you got another uh, performance per, uh, improvement of about a factor of 5 to 10. And that's nothing to sneeze at. But your program ran twice as fast to begin with, and then it got even faster, so I mean, it blew everything else away. All right, so I'm a young, impressionable grad student. I'm talking to my advisor, and we say, you know, we know how to write vectorizing code. Why don't we start a company and then we'll sell a lot of compilers? We'll be millionaires. <laughs> oh, the things I did not know then. Yeah, so we did. We started a company. This was Cook and Associates, which you know, had some history in the day. And then a few years later, we went to the Siam Parallel Processing Conference with our software. We said, look, we can auto, parallel, auto vectorize your programs. I said, why do we want that? Cray compiler is great. It vectorizes all my loops. I don't need your software. Okay, so that was less than five years, between 78 and 82. What happened between those four years? Did the Cray compiler get that much better? And the answer is a little bit, but not that much better. What happened was the Cray compiler did not just vectorize your program or not, it gave you a vectorization listing. Loop at 425 vectorized. Loop at 622 vectorized. So loop at 701 did not vectorize. Your loop did not vectorize. It did not vectorize because you have an if statement in it. Your loop did not vectorize because you call the subroutine. You have an IO statement. You have an unknown variable in the second subscript of A that I can't tell what it is, so I can't vectorize that loop. It was very precise. Then he would say, oh, if statement. Well, they didn't vectorize if statements for <clears throat> reasonably good reasons at the time, but they didn't. So, But they had this vector merge function. So you put in a vector merge function. Oh, now it vectorizes. Oh, a subroutine call. Well, I'll I'll either expand the subroutine or I'll push the loop into the subroutine. And the I.O., ah, that's just a, a debugging I.O., I'll take that out. And, oh, this variable, I'll put in a directive to tell the, the loop is vectorizable. And then there's four happy programmers. Okay, so three things happened there. One is all their programs ran fast. Second one is they learned, I won't put ifs in my inner loops. I won't put subroutine calls in my inner loops, and, and so on down the line. And the third that's Equally, and if not more important, was, well, then IBM came out with a vector machine, and Fujitsu, and NEC, and Hitachi, and Convey, or not, Convex, sorry, and everybody in the world came out with these vector machines. And those programs vectorized and ran fast across all of them. So the programming model was portable. So that's why, it was, that's why I say it was successful. It may not have vectorized your program, but eventually your program ran in vector mode. Automatic, right? Yeah, 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 but... But the compiler was successful. <coughs> and it, it's not going to be, OK. Now, his point is true, right? The compiler is never going to be able to do everything automatically. But how much can it do with user input? OK, so the, why was that successful, and why, sh why won't this be successful? And the, the key reason is, if the compiler made a bad decision, I don't mean an incorrect decision, but decided here, I'm not going to vectorize this loop. The performance hit was significant. 
um, but not an order of magnitude. Now for a GPU, if I decide to run, a, if I, the compiler writer, decide I'm going to run this loop on a GPU and it's just a tiny loop and needs a lot of data, the performance penalty of a bad decision is humongous. It's huge. Moreover, because the data locality is so important, where you need to run this loop depends on where the data is now. So in order to make a decision, I need a global view. It's not, I mean, vectorization is inner loop analysis, basically. And the analysis we're talking about is, if it's not a whole program analysis, it's certainly beyond subroutine boundary analysis. So that's a fruitful area of research. And someone in the academic field ought to be looking at that. In fact, I used to be an academic, and I was trying to look at problems like that. But I was, I'm a failed academic, and so here I am. Um, although, that being said, one of the ways we test our compiler is with a, a flag that says, put ACC kernels around the body of this subroutine and, and generate everything, and then we'll see how correct that is. But no, that's it's not a performant way to do. All right. Okay, so that's uh, the, the initial high-level summary of the uh, directives, the directives that you'll want. Um, there's a, a bit more here, material here. So how do you use the compilers? So here we're talking the PGI compilers, PG Fortran, a.k.a. PGF90, a.k.a. PGF95. We decided we were didn't want to make one for every year, so what do we just call a PG Fortran? Um, one of your friends will be the dash help flag. If you just give the dash help flag, it'll give you help for every command line option. If you put some, say help dash TA, this is target accelerator, it'll give you the help for that flag. Or help dash help dash ACC will give you the help for the ACC flag. Um, dash ACC, so with, um, with uh, PGI compiler, dash MP enables the OpenMP directives. Dash ACC enables the OpenACC directives. With PGI, dash PTP selects the target processor, and the default is the processor you're running on. Dash TA selects the target accelerator. And if you just say dash ACC, the default is Tesla comma host. And that means it'll generate code for an NVIDIA Tesla GPU or, I'm sorry, and host, running sequentially on the host. Sequentially on the host, which we'll get into a little bit later on. Um, but you could just say T equals Tesla and have sub-options if you know you're going to have a GPU. If, you, if the default would be Tesla comma host, meaning at runtime it'll check. Is there a GPU device? If there is, it'll use it. And if not, then it'll just run on the host. Um, but if there is one, it'll use the one you've got even if it's too slow, even if it's just a tiny embedded GPU. And mInfo, and I have a couple of examples of mInfo, but I encourage you to look at mInfo, or at least mInfo equals Excel. These will be the informational messages coming out of the compiler for the OpenACC analysis. And uh, this would be like your, those vectorization report. This tells you what it did, it tells you when it generated a kernel, it tells you what loops are running in what mode, what data is being moved to the device. And then you just compile, link, and run. All right, there's, unlike other, uh, in the past, there have been other models where you end up with two objects, and then you have to create two binaries to run on the host and one for the device. None of that here. I'll just, that just works as you expect it to. Um, there are some sub-options that are useful. Uh, ACC equals no autopar would disable the autoparallelization. You might want this if either you don't trust the autoparallelization um, uh, or, or well, if you don't trust it. I, I'm trying to think of another reason. There was one. I can't think of one. ACC equals sync. So we're talking about asynchronous operations, and we'll get into that. But it's async clauses which tell it to run this kernel launch asynchronously or this data movement asynchronously. And if you have an async error or you think you might have an async error, setting this flag will ignore those clauses. And if it works with that flag set and fails without that flag set, you, have, you need some wait directives in there, some synchronization directives. You can select the target compute capability. Now, here you're running on a device with compute capability 3.5, so you would want to select... CC35. The default is generate all of these. 
including 5.0, which is Maxwell. Um, and it doesn't cost anything except compile time, but it does cost compile time. And it's not our problem. It's because we're using the, the device code generator to generate the device binaries, and it has to call that device code generator once for each compute capability. Uh, select the toolkit version. So the default with the version you've got installed is 6.5. It worked with the 7.0 driver. That's not a problem. Um, the default uh, with um, 15.9 will be 7.0, which just came out. So our default is usually one back from whatever the latest release is. And the reason we make it one back from the latest release is our customers are not guys working on the workstations. Our customers are guys working on supercomputers. And it takes them a while to update their software. We just want it to work. Okay, some other things here. So no FMA and fast math. This has to do with precision. So fast math, NVIDIA, because with graphics, you know, you're doing a sign operation to do compute the, the um, particular shade of red to use in one pixel of Lara Croft's cheek. So it's off by a small fraction. Nobody's going to notice it's only one frame. But if you're computing weather, that might be important. So... Um, fast math would say it's an okay to use low precision math libraries, sine, cosine, the transcendentals, but usually not. No FMA, so the fuse multiply add. So <clears throat> CPUs, many of them, I think, do you have Haswell's on the system you have here, or is it Sandy Bridge? Haswell's. So I think Haswell's have a fuse multiply add as well. Yeah. Um, so. The fuse multiply add on the host and on the device. They both work almost the same way. They do the multiply, and then they send that result to the add, but they don't round the multiply result before they send it to the add. So it's sending more bits to the add. So it's a better result, but it's a different result. It's a different result than if it did not do the fused mul add. So uh, if you're comparing CPU versus GPU results, one difference may be that either one side is doing a fuels multiply add, the other side is not, or there's slight differences in the implementations. So you can disable it. Here, this would disable it only on the device. There's also a dash capital M no FMA, which disables it across host and device. Um, let me talk about these momentarily. Is that everything else? So managed. So T equals Tesla colon managed. It's a PGI option only. And this tells the compiler... Two, for all Fortran allocate, deallocate statements in that routine you're compiling. And in C, for all malloc and free, and in C++, all new and delete in malloc and free, replace those with versions that allocate out of managed memory, CUDA managed memory, or CUDA unified memory. And that simplifies many things. It doesn't simplify everything, but it simplifies many things as... Uh, Jeremy mentioned this morning, um, the, there are some downsides. The downside is you, you can run out of memory because you're limited to the size of your device memory, but you've got 12 gigabytes here. It's pretty big. Uh, you don't have to think about data movement because the driver will move the data to the device. The downside is the driver moves all the data to the device every, for every kernel launch, and if it's already there, there's nothing to move, but it doesn't know what data is going to be used, so it has to move it all. Um, okay, but that's, that's uh, useful to play with. And that's that is intercepting only allocated. Only allocatable data, dynamically allocated data. Nothing for stack, um, nothing for static, and automatic arrays, if they're deferred shape, they would be allocated, so I think they would also be allocated in managed memory. Uh, and for PGI, our our um, deferred shape arrays are not allocated on the stack. They're allocated on the heap. And this new feature, T equals multicore. Someone asked me about this, uh, I think it was at lunch. So this is uh, available in 15.7. I don't know if you installed the package for that here. So it was available as a separate download. Um, and in 15.9, it will be default available in the compiler. And this will tell the compiler to generate parallel code on your multi-core host processor for OpenACC, parallel, and kernels regions. Data movement essentially gets ignored because you're running on the host. The data's on the host. There's nothing to move, nothing to allocate. So not only do I 
not need to generate code. I don't even need to test if I need to generate code because there's nothing to do. Um, now, this is, now it's a, being beta tested. It's pretty good. Um, it's not perfect and it's not tuned at all. We make no claims that it's highly tuned for multi-core processor, but our results so far have been pretty good. I have some performance numbers I'd, I'd like to show you, but um, particularly for you guys, you got this, you have dual processor Haswells on your, on your uh, nodes? Yeah, so that's a pretty beefy, things can run really fast on a dual processor Haswell. You got 32 cores and it's, it just screams actually. 20, Per Haswell? No, because ours have 16 per second. What's the matter with yours? <laughs> okay, okay. So um, uh, in particular, um, it will only parallelize one loop. Even if you use the collapse clause, it's only going to parallelize one of those loops. Uh, that's just the way it is today. And it does no optimization for vector, ignores worker entirely. And uh, so our... Our goal is going to be, we're going to be supporting Knight's Landing once we get our hands on it. Um, obviously, Intel's not going to let us use one ahead of time. Um, but, but we need to optimize the vector operations as well for, for Knight's Landing. Why should that be any faster than running with the, the normal optimization for? <laughs> uh, well, parallel. You're saying, why is it any faster than OpenMP? Okay, if you have OpenMP already, it's basically going to be the same as OpenMP. But if you want to write one program that works both here and here, that's not OpenMP. No, my point is more that uh, typically in our own application IFS, we have a very high level uh, ah! OpenMP. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, then you don't need that. Yeah, you don't need that. Um, some other options you might be interested in is in the inline option, two levels of inlining, n levels of inlining, enable optimization. PGI default is to enable without op is to compile without optimizations. Other compilers, their default is compile with full optimizations. Cray, I think, in particular, um, their default is to op turn all optimizations on. Uh, our most, I won't say fastest optimizations, but our um, balance between performance and compile time is is dash fast. That's what we usually use ourselves. I already mentioned target processor. You probably never think, never need to think about TP flag because you're always running on the machine. You're going to you recompile often enough. It's not an issue. It's the ISVs need to worry about that, right? They're compiling and their customers are running on other processors. So then running the program. So um, here you're using Slurm, is it right? That yes. that sets your GPU number or number of GP, whatever it is, right? So you probably don't need to think about this. Um, if you, were, if you wanted to run on a different device number. Well, Slurm is going to solve this problem for you. That's not an issue. Uh, two things that you might be interested in. This will be a, a low impact performance data collection. Uh, PJACC time is a, if it's an environment variable that's set to, say, one, or any number not zero, then when the program runs, it will do some lightweight performance data collection and print out a summary at the end where it's spending its time for each region, how much time is spending moving data, how much time is spent uh, doing uh, uh, kernels launches. We use this a lot just because it's lightweight and it's a text output. PGI ACC notify, if you're trying to decide if anything's actually, is data actually being moved, is any kernel being launched. So you can set this, it's a bit mask, 1248.16, and it'll tell you each one of these events that gets used. And if you're really interested and want to do your own data collection, we have an open interface that you can insert into your program and, and um, link in either with a dynamic library or static library and uh, get event callbacks from the OpenACC runtime. A little bit about performance tuning, and I actually have no idea how many slides I have here, but I only have 15 minutes left, so I'm going to talk really fast at this point. No, I'm not. We already talked about minimize frequency and volume of data traffic in an irregularity. You want regularly infrequent small volumes of data. Well, you can't have all of those, but you get as many as you can. And as Jeremy said, as much parallelism as possible. You just think nested parallel loops all running in parallel. That's how you're going to get performance on these devices. And 
Um, so th the three th steps are manage your data because the number one bottleneck to performance is going to be moving data between host and device. The number two bottleneck is going to be sequential loops. And the number three is going to be tuning your kernels. That would be looking at those mInfo messages and saying, ah, it's only running gang parallel. I need something to run vector parallel to use the threads within a thread block. Okay, well, uh, we'll get to async here. Um, we already talked a little bit about data management. Uh, schedule tuning, I've already mentioned. So um, you want enough gangs running in parallel, and you want enough vector lanes. You want long enough vector length. And you can do loop collapsing to get longer vectors or more gangs. I already mentioned worker parallelism for intermediate loops, but I'm not going to talk about that anymore here today. Um, this was the example we saw before where I want both gang and vector parallelism on that loop. Now, you can specify num gangs or vector length. And today, vector length has to be a literal constant, but, or at least a compile time constant. Num gangs can be an expression. And the default, particularly when you have parallel loop, is going to be look at the trip count of the loop and generate. This would be something like 128, and this would be the trip count over 128 and then run that, run that loop. Now, um, this morning, Jeremy had this example where uh, n was 1.25 million instead of 125,000. So he launched a, a 128, had a thread block of 128, 1,000 thread blocks, <coughs> but n was 10 times too big. Remember that? No? Yes? No? Somebody's nodding? Nobody's nodding? If each thread only does one iteration of the loop, you have to launch enough gangs with enough threads within a gang, enough thread blocks with enough threads within a thread block so that each iteration gets done. In this case, I'm only launching you know, 192 threads. No, 1,920 threads, sorry. Right, so what if n is bigger than 1,920? Or what if n is bigger than 30? And, okay. So here's where the compiler is your friend. It doesn't matter. It's going to strip mine those loops the way compilers have done since 1975 and generate the right code so that all the iterations will happen <laughs> regardless of number of gangs or vector length. Is the compiler all, your compiler? all compilers. If a compiler does not do that, it's a buggy compiler and should be <coughs> binned. Not all Sorry? Not all By definition, I think, yes. Um, inside kernels, now you'll see in OpenACC 2.5, you can also specify num gangs and vector lengths, but not today. Today you could specify the number of gangs and the vector length to use on the gang and vector clauses themselves. And some of this is for historical reasons, but there it is. And a PGI feature is PGI only, and there are other ways to do this, but you can have nested gang and nested vector loops. This is kind of like tiling. Right? It's generating a 4 by 32 tile. And the reason you would want, might want to generate tiles is you have locality in your loop. This is a bad example, but maybe you have, you're referring to BI and BI minus one and CJ and CJ minus one. So you have locality of reference in both dimensions. And you want to take advantage of that. So you might want to generate tile loops. We've seen nice examples where this runs really well, but I wouldn't stress about it just yet. Yes? Is that something that allows the compiler to use the stretch? The, the, uh, what he, the shared memory? Shared memory. And, um, Sometimes, yes, although um, I will admit the PGI compiler used to be a lot better at it than it is today. And I have to do routine. I mentioned this morning, or earlier today, when you're compiling with subroutine calls inside your compute regions, the subroutine has to be compiled for the device. And today in our Fortran compiler and in other compilers as well, you have to tell what routines to compile for the device. So we have this directive, ACC routine, which says compile this routine for whatever device you're compiling for. 
Moreover, you've got to tell it what type of parallelism is used in the routine. Is there a gang parallel loop in the routine? You have to say routine gang. Is there a vector parallel loop in the routine? You say routine vector. If there's no parallelism in the routine, you just say routine SEQ, sequential routine. And you're going to say, well, I don't have to do that for OpenMP. Why don't I have to do that for OpenMP? Ha! You will. OK, OpenMP has three levels of parallelism. Teams, para threads, and SIMD. They don't allow you to have team parallelism in a routine because teams must be tightly enclosed within target. So they, just, they, don't, they define the gang problem away. And what about SIMD? Well, you have to say routine SIMD if you want the SIMD call inside a SIMD loop. So you will have that problem if you don't yet. Wait, is that a directive or a it's a directive. It's a directive. Here, we'll show you an example. So here, that's the routine. And I've got gang parallelism inside the routine. To compile this for the device, I would say routine gang. So it's, it's a declarer. Declarative directive. Question back there? No. I've never, I've never used it so far, this uh, routine directive. Why do I need it now? If you, if you have this inside a compute region, a call to this inside a compute region. Um, let me come up with a better example here. Like here, okay, inside ACC parallel, I'm going to do multiple calls to different routines. So now this is running on the device itself. So I only want to do one launch, and I want several things to happen on the device, okay? And so the, if you put this in an interface block, the ACC routine has to match. If, uh, or you can put it in a module. You're all using modules in Fortran, right? So then it just, you, don't, you only need to put it once because it would be carried in the module information. In many cases, yes. Maybe most cases, yes. But certainly not all cases. There were, um, I've seen uh, the most common cases where it's just some sequential utility routine. That just, it's just a sequential routine. So I just want it to, to uh, you know, routine sequential, compile it for the device. It gets called. It's, there's nothing happening inside. No optimization is going to happen. So you just call it and return. Uh, the other one, is, and we've seen some cases where there is a whole deep call tree. I've got this outer parallel loop and then a whole bunch of stuff going on. And then inside, I mean, I'm, this is serious, six levels deep, there's a vector loop or many vector loops. And so I've got to manage this whole call tree and put it all on the device. And so the compiler does that for you. And I'm going to make a note of that. We don't have that yet. That's, that's, a, that's a fair point. Well, it's not quite the same as, say, auto parallelization. It's, it's pretty big close, big. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you, you, you've got this inline. So what does that mean? And the Cray compiler is much better at inlining than the PGI compiler. The Cray compiler uh, can inline basically anything everywhere, anywhere. And in the, when they first started working on OpenACC for Titan anyway, before we had the routine directive, that was the way they did procedure calls. They inlined everything. So they would effectively end up with these compute regions that would be thousands of lines long. And then they would optimize the heck out of it. And, and the downside is their compile time sucks. Um, so we, our inliner is not as, as good as theirs. And uh, we chose not to go that route. But this is part of the standard, so any compiler can take this. So uh, is one of those ACC routines like A sub, can that call another? Oh, yes. Yeah, so it's a nested. Sure. Yes. Um, now, here, for instance, I said routine gang. So I, I could call another routine that had routine gang on it, or I could have a loop gang, and then here have another call a routine that had routine vector on it, and then and then it could call routines that had routine sequential on it, for instance. So yes, you, you obviously can call, as we've had a customer, at six levels deep. Okay. 
Okay, and this would be the, the um, inside a loop gang I can call a routine vector. But inside loop gang I cannot call routine gang. Uh, what we don't have today is, is good error checking. Suppose you lie here, and inside here you put an interface block saying this is routine gang, but it's really only routine vector. And what happens inside for that call? What happens is you get bad answers. We don't have any checking at compile time, link time, or runtime saying that the, the um, uh, routine operator matches for across there. The routine clause matches, sorry. But you can guess we probably will at some point. And uh, this is uh, another example of the same thing. So the routine directive, you've got the routine directive say this routine is compiled for that uh, level of parallelism. And then you can say a subroutine that I'm called is compiled for that level of parallelism. Or you could use an interface block or, as I said, you can put these all in modules, which is what we would um, recommend. Okay, so there's the summary. You have to know it's being compiled for the device. The caller and the callee must agree. And we would encourage you to pass scalars by value. And uh, for reasons of which I am minorly embarrassed, I would encourage you to pass by value. So uh, a couple more slides in here, asynchronous operations. So there's this async clause on your kernels launch and your update clauses and on the enter data and exit data um, and that would do all the data movement or kernel launches asynchronously. So async, you can either just say async, or you can have async and a parenthesis and an integer expression and a closed parenthesis. Usually it's a constant, doesn't need to be. And it would give the queue number. So there's, with PGI, there are 18 queues it supports. One of them is the default, when you have async with no value. Then we have put a value on there. We map that to uh, numbers between 0 and 16, 0 and 15, sorry. It would be one of the identified async queues. And the last one, the 18th one, is for the synchronous queue. That's the queue we put things on when you launch mm -hmm. synchronously. Um, yeah, it's not actually modulo, but close enough, yeah. It's just a mapping down there. Um, and then you can wait. You can wait on all the queues. You can wait on specific queues. You can launch synchronization between the queues. We'll show that momentarily, and I'll get to that last thing momentarily as well. So here's where I can do my parallel loops, and now the host launches this thing off and then it, it keeps on going and it launches another one, it keeps on going, it launches another one, and then down here the host waits. And we can see some examples, and I probably won't be able to show it here, sorry, where, um, uh, you, you, well, close enough, where uh, if, when you do um, uh, profiling, uh, this shows some nice performance benefits. It's not a barrier on the device. This is the host waiting for all these things to um, reach this point. Every, everything that's been launched asynchronously must finish before here. Uh, I found that if you have a lot of loops, uh, parallel regions, uh, so it benefits to put this async even if, if you don't have async there because between uh, uh, parallel loops, there is uh, otherwise two dot thread synchronized or something. <coughs> This async, uh, although artificial, gets rid of it. Um, but then you have to remember to put ACC wait. So um, the, the, the point being that what if I don't put async? In CUDA, a kernel launch is asynchronous. There's, there's no way to have a synchronous kernel launch. It, it's a launch, and then the host continues on. With OpenACC, this turns into a CUDA kernel, and it's a launch, but the host waits at the end for that to finish. Now, one might ask, well, I mean, um, what are you waiting for? How can you tell? You can't tell until the data comes back. So we have another hidden flag that tells it, okay, don't wait. And until you, because the data movement, it will wait. Data movement has to, right? But here, the kernel launch, it typically does not wait. But your point is that if you put async, then the host can continue on and then only has to wait at the end of a sequence of these, right? It does show up, yes. Sometimes 
it, it's a lot. You'll see these. It's either thread synchronized, it's CUDA thread synchronized, or CUDA thread synchronized. Um, when you look at the um, NVVP, you can put an expression in there, and this ACC weight will wait for all the queues. You can put an expression on the weight so it only waits on Q1. Uh, let's see here. You can launch each of these on a different queue. Now, you launch these on different queues, then they are asynchronous with respect to each other, and you don't know what order they're going to execute in. They may execute completely out of order. They may overlap. You can't depend on any ordering between them whatsoever. And the weight will wait on all of them. Or here I can say the weight to only wait on one and two, but three may not finish until some later time. Or three may finish first. You don't know because it's completely asynchronous with respect to the other queues and the host. And in fact, here I'm putting a, a synchronization from Q2 onto Q1. Okay, so what this says is on to, don't put anything else on, don't start anything on Q1 until everything launched on Q2 up to this point is finished. But the host continues on. And so this launch will not proceed until both of the first two finish. But the host will continue on until the wait statement. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's a queue, right? So they get, they execute the, it's a, it's a FIFO queue. And they, the second one won't start till the first one is done, be it data movement or kernel launch. Uh, for CUDA programmers, it maps to a CUDA stream. And you can do updates. So uh, launch, uh, data movement, another launch, and then await. And so these things will execute in order because they're on the same queue. Ah, he's way ahead of us here, right? So what happens with something like CUDA blas or QFFT and so on? Okay, so uh, you can do this with two, in two ways. One of them is with CUDA and QFFT, you can set the queue it's going to use. This CUDA stream, CUDA set, CUDA, CUDA set stream, or QFFT set stream. And you can get the CUDA stream that OpenACC is using for its asynchronous operations. All right, well, what if you're not using streams? You're just running this... On, on the default CUDA stream, because PGI does not use the default CUDA stream here. This is a problem. People do run into this. So the work around there, which we'll get into, is um, we have a way to override that. So here's our most common directives. I'll come back, to, I'm come back to that exact question. Here's our most common directives. I'm just going to skip that because we've already seen all examples of these. I don't think there's anything new there. We've seen building the programs. Uh, and I, I'm embarrassed to say, I didn't show any other mInfo messages all the time, but this is a particular example showing, for instance, uh, the copy in, copy out, the data that's being uh, generated either implicitly or explicitly because you have data directives or because you didn't have data directives. The compiler looked inside and said, oh, these arrays need to move. So this is the data that I'm going to move at this point. And remember again with PGI, these all mean present or. Here's the compiler does the analysis, even in ACC parallel. It's going to do the analysis and tell you what loops are parallelizable. And then this is the one you need here. A kernel was generated. This is the schedule, what we call the schedule. So gang and vector parallelism. In this case, two-dimensional gang and vector parallelism. And it even tells you the CUDA indices used for each loop. You can do the first two, but not the third. And if you really want to, you do a Tesla keep GPU comma no LLVM. So keep GPU tells it to keep the generated code. And this says, I want to see it in CUDA C, not LLVM IR, which is our default mode. And good bloody luck reading that. I use that a lot, but sorry. It 
It gets really hard to read. Now, okay, to be fair, if you want to kind of see what's going on, to be friendly to you guys, because, you know, you're almost good guys, you can add an O0, and then it does not do all the device optimizations, and maybe you can figure out what it thinks it's doing there. 